and I'm happy to welcome you to this latest event in our SRSG series. Uh, our featured guest today is Karen Langren, who has just completed 18 busy months of service as the Special Representative of the Secretary General and Head of the UN Office in Burundi, and is this month taking up her new post representing the Secretary General and heading up the UN mission in Liberia. The SRSG series is a particular favorite of mine at IPI because it gives us here in New York a chance to hear directly from those in the field. And for an old newspaper foreign correspondent like me, there is nothing better than that. In fact, in my years at the New York Times, I was on two ends of that equation, both as the foreign editor directing the people in the field from New York and as a foreign correspondent, a person in the field taking directions from the foreign editor in New York. Now, whether it's the New York Times, the United Nations, or any other international organization, things look different seen from the ground than they do seen from a remote headquarters. And the aim of this series is to add clarity to that communication. We will be talking about Burundi today, but I wanted to note that IPI had Karen's predecessor as SRS Chief of Liberia, Ellen Margareta Loy, here twice during her tenure. And let me extend an invitation right now to you, Karen, to come speak here again on one of your future trips back to New York from Monrovia. Uh, and just to complete that circle, we had the person succeeding Karen in Burundi, Parfait Onanga, I'm here last Monday for a private ambassadorial dinner we hosted for Jan Eliasson, the new Deputy Secretary General. At that time, I invited Parfait to come today, uh, but he had to decline because he had to be in Addis Ababa today for the meeting of the African Union. Burundi on July 1st celebrated 50 years of independence, though it has been a very difficult half century for the country. Just a decade ago, Burundi was a conflict-ravaged country, but today it's moving towards new elections scheduled in 2015, and much of the UN's work has been devoted to encouraging and assisting the normalization of relations between all political parties and groups in anticipation of that vote. Burundi is also a focal point for peace building and development strategies and for efforts to ensure human rights and free exercise of political expression, and for steps to advance public financial management and the creation of a judicial system, and finally, of a legal and institutional framework for fighting corruption. Though free of the wide-scale violence it has known, it is now grappling with a spate of extrajudicial killings. You have Karen's full biography in your papers, and you can see the wealth of experience she has had working for the UN in a number of places, including Bosnia-Herzegovina, Eritrea, Singapore, India, the Philippines, and in Nepal, where prior to taking up the assignment in Burundi, she was the representative of the Secretary General. <clears throat> I met Karen here in, at IPI in May when she attended an event we had on the publication of a book on Nepal. And as I have indicated, I hope to see her back here in the year to come to talk about her new post in Liberia. But today, our subject is Burundi. And I'm delighted to turn the floor over to the person who has been directing the UN activities there for the past year and a half. Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Warren, you and your colleagues, for giving me this opportunity to talk about Burundi. Actually, there are not that many opportunities created to talk about Burundi. <laughs> and when Warren first invited me to speak, he said, uh, which was two months ago, he said, we'll be happy to have you come and talk about Liberia. <laughs> and I said, before you do that, you have to hear me talk about uh, Burundi. Also delighted to see so many uh, old colleagues in the audience, a permanent representative of Burundi to the UN, Hermes Nyonzima. Uh, lovely to, uh, to have you here, because this is a country that unfortunately hardly shows up on the international radar. Uh, it's a very interesting contrast to Rwanda in that regard. Now, Burundi has the opportunity to be an extraordinary success, and whether it is or not may be determined in the next three years. 
So this is a place to watch, and this is the time to watch it. 2012 is and will continue to be a big year. As Warren mentioned, uh, two weeks ago, Burundi celebrated its 50th anniversary of, of independence. And for Burundi's diplomatic partners, there was particular interest in what President Nkurunziza had to say uh, on that day, because the 50th has been heralded as a new beginning, a fresh opening to reconciliation and national unity. Am I speaking close enough to the mic? Can, can you hear it, Karen, OK? OK. Uh, thanks. There are other reasons why 2012 is also a pivotal year. It's uh, the year when transitional justice processes are expected to begin in Burundi. It's a year when uh, discussion of constitutional revision is likely to start. It's a year when members of the National Independent Electoral Commission are to be selected, and this is the team that will uh, see the task through to the next elections in 2015. We are now, in any case, at the midpoint for elections, uh, at a time when the opposition say they want to be back in for the next elections. This is when this is expected to happen as well. And late October this year, there will be an international partner conference on and for Burundi in Geneva, another opportunity for uh, partners to contribute and for Burundi to set out its record of achievements, which are considerable. The UN mission's current mandate runs until February 2013. Uh, Burundi transitioned very successfully from a peacekeeping mission early on, 2007, to a special political mission, and then 2010-2011 uh, to a smaller special political mission. This phase is generally seen as the last one of intensified political support before Burundi goes back to having a regular UN country team. So again, we're confident that Burundi will make this phase, duration not yet determined, uh, also into a, a success. I want to focus on two uh, critical issues that are part of the mission's mandate, uh, also part of creating a a, a stable and democratic Burundi, and those are the question of political space and transitional justice. Um, by the way, I should say that the mission has a very good mandate. I'm pleased to be able to say that. Not every mission can say that. It's a clear mandate. It encompasses most relevant issues, and it already anticipates transition. Midway through 2012, Burundi is relatively uh, stable in security terms. But there are uh, questions that remain about the commitment to democracy and about its readiness to deal with the past. Uh, Burundi's progress, as I mentioned, has been quite remarkable. There have been two successful elections since 2005. But it's been uneven, and Burundi is still a fragile state, regarded as such by the World Bank and others. Having said that Burundi is uh, relatively stable in security terms, it's quite ironic that most of Burundi's negative press lately has been over security. Uh, for a long time, every Reuters report on Burundi that I would read uh, would, would throw in the specter of rebellion, normally in the lead. Uh, whatever the story was, it was, and by the way, rebellion is just around the corner. Uh, there was a particularly bad week in the middle of August where The Economist headlined an article on Burundi, A Sour Mood, and the subtext was rebellion beckons again. And in the same week, most unfortunately, ICG issued their latest report called A Crisis of, of Corruption, where they also talked about the threat of armed violence in the next five years. I think this is probably overstated. And when we look to things that, uh, that merit addressing in Burundi for future stability, I'm not going to look immediately at the security, direct security issues. When the major opposition parties walked out of Burundi partway through the 2010 elections, they may have thought that they could negotiate a power-sharing deal. But there was no international support for that. 
It didn't happen. Several leaders then left the country, but not all. The result in subsequent rounds was that President Kurunziza was elected with uh, over 90% of the vote. The ruling party having secured 64% in the first round, which included all the, all the parties. The National Assembly uh, currently has 81% 80, of its members from, uh, from the ruling uh, party. The Uprona party is really the only party that has some leverage, but it's not opposition. It is in the government. There is no parliamentary opposition in Burundi. Since the elections and through 2011, we experienced attacks on police stations, at roadblocks, uh, checkpoints, members of the intelligence services. And there is no doubt uh, that some parties attempted or flirted with rebellion, a return to rebellion. This, is, this also comes across through the uh, Committee of Experts report on uh, DRC sanctions. Uh, they now all seem to have walked away from any such thinking. It's hard to know for sure. But what is clear is that rebellion is unlikely to succeed under current conditions. Uh, for most Burundians, the spark is just not there. The issues that could launch a rebellion are no longer there. As they say in French, pas de déclic. Uh, nothing is going to set this off again now. There is little ideological basis for the opposition, uh, little vision or programs to distinguish them. It's really mostly about uh, the personal. It's about access to influence and especially about access to resources. It's generally acknowledged that Burundi's opposition made a grave political error in withdrawing from the 2010 elections. And some of them will also acknowledge that privately. They are, we think, trying to wind their way back from that now. That's a good thing. That's an important move. For a couple of years, analysts, including ICG, have uh, talked with concern about what they see as an authoritarian drift, quote unquote, in Burundi, uh, and the risk of a one-party state. I'm quoting them. But here, I think we have to say that the opposition, as well, by staying away from the elections, by contemplating rebellion in some cases, have also contributed to damaging the prospects for pluralism in Burundi. However, it's also true that the country's enhanced security now follows uh, 2011, where we saw uh, intimidation of political parties and a number of extrajudicial killings. Uh, the UN mission documented 61 extrajudicial killings in Burundi in 2011. They were not all manifestly political, and they were certainly not the sum total of extrajudicial killings in Burundi that year. These are the cases we documented to the satisfaction of, of the UN. Uh, so the likelihood is that the number was higher, and they were mainly in the second half of, uh, of the year. Impunity is a continuing issue, a continuing problem. About this time last year, President Nkurunziza made a public call to the leaders of the opposition to come back, which was welcomed. But for the rest of the year, the message, I think it has to be said, was somewhat ambiguous. We had the upsurge in killings and intimidation. We had, in January this year, the arrest of one of the leaders of the opposition, Alexis Sinuhije, in uh, Tanzania. He was held for about uh, two weeks. So the message to come back was attenuated. The mission continues to work largely behind the scenes on political dialogue. And uh, in recent months, we're encouraged that the government, while rejecting the idea of any negotiations, has shown itself 
open to discussing uh, conditions for return. And I think it's recognized that the opposition needs to be back uh, not only to take part in the 2015 elections, but in good time to prepare uh, for that. The Security Council adopted quite a tough resolution in uh, December last year, calling for an end to extrajudicial executions and to impunity. What we've seen this year is that the killings have come down. And uh, the UN has, to the end of June, documented 13 uh, so far this year. What is at least as important as having uh, opposition leaders back in the country is making sure that political parties in country have the space to operate uh, you know, at a much more quotidian level. And here we have some concerns about shrink the shrinking of political space, that parties, especially outside the capital, have difficulties even convening regular meetings. And uh, this is uh, coupled with continuing periodic harassment of civil society and of the media. Uh, and I say more about these issues in my council briefing, which you can look at online. It is clear that any continued reduction of political space uh, any difficulties put in the path of opposition leaders who want to return will tend to undermine the 2015 elections, the prospects for uh, democracy in Burundi, and risk undermining Burundi's image, or to put it differently, risk reinforcing the image of Burundi as a weak and insecure state, which in turn is going to hamper efforts to bring in the foreign investment which Burundi so badly needs. I'll come back later to some of the development issues uh, in Burundi. President Nkurunziza pledged at his 2010 swearing in to provide political space for all uh, parties. And from the UN's perspective, the ruling party has every reason to approach this with confidence. I've already talked about the numbers with which uh, they were elected. Uh, the president appears genuinely very popular. He's always out among the people and in the countryside. It's probably the case that not all players find it easy to leave the old mentality of enemies uh, behind, but it's hard to see how the ruling party would lose if they move forward with, uh, with dialogue and opening up the political space. This year, there have been a number of contacts between the ruling party and the opposition, which we're very encouraged by. There's been a lot of what people call signaling for, uh, uh, for a resolution of, of what is a bit of an impasse. And every other week uh, when I was in Burundi, someone would tell me, you know, we all know each other very well, implying we can resolve this. That's true. But people will also tell you that uh, Burundi's best examples of uh, resolution have come with the assistance of third parties, the Arusha Accords being the classic example. However it happens, this question of political dialogue needs to move forward to leave less space for conflict in the future. I mentioned the Arusha Accords, and that brings me to the question of other actors. Uh, the Arusha Accord process was begun by Nyerere, President Nyerere, as you know, and it was concluded by, by President Mandela. Uh, it's an extraordinary agreement which covers transitional power sharing, it covers ethnic quotas in some functions, and transitional justice, including the writing of a shared history, a common history of Burundi, and this common understanding of what happened and why doesn't exist now. Uh, South Africa and Tanzania have played historic roles with Burundi, and in fact, President Zuma visited last year. Um, his statement was striking for not making any comment on Burundi's political situation, which was a disappointment to the opposition. Uh, but he did refer repeatedly to the need for African solutions to African problems. Again, the context at this point was very much uh, Cote d'Ivoire and, and Libya. But 
we've also seen in Burundi uh, the important role that the AU played through Ambassador Ba, who unfortunately passed away last year. So I think it could be beneficial as well to see a reinvigorated uh, regional role in supporting Burundi's uh, transition. I wanted to turn to another uh, important element of the UN mandate, which is supporting Burundi in transitional justice. This is a critical part of the Arusha Peace Accord. Not all the rebel groups were included in that accord, and uh, two of the most important, the FTD and the then Palipehutu FNL, concluded separate peace agreements later, in 2003 and 2006. The last named only fully took hold in 2008. But those agreements provided for provisional immunity for uh, all parties to the conflict until a TRC, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, was in place. Few parties haven't been accused of some involvement in uh, the bloody ethnic crimes uh, in Burundi's past. The UN has been discussing transitional justice with Burundi since 2006. In 2009, there was quite an important national consultation process, which was tripartite, government, UN, and civil society, uh, which was a very formal process and showed that most Burundians want a transitional justice process to take place. However, the president said very little about these issues at the 50th, uh, to, our, to our disappointment. And one might conclude that transitional justice has seen a slowdown. After great enthusiasm last year, we hope uh, there hasn't been a reversal. A technical committee submitted a report and draft legislation and even a budget in October last year. That seems to have been put on, on ice ever since. We think there's an eagerness there to close out this chapter of obligations under Arusha. But it has to be more than a box ticking exercise. The UN gave extensive comments on the draft legislation. Uh, but what is also emerging in private conversations is that many people are very worried about where a transitional discussion, justice discussion could lead. They're worried about the facts that would come out, about the fingers that would be, uh, would be pointed. And uh, what one person said to me was, the political situation still needs to be more serene before we embark on transitional justice. Increasingly, the official discourse uh, we now hear insists that reconciliation has already been attained. So subtext, maybe we don't need this after all. And I think uh, reading the tea leaves, the risk is that the emphasis is going to be much more on pardon than on the truth bit, let alone the justice uh, bit. So the question is whether this is going to contribute to genuine reconciliation, uh, which also needs to involve Burundians reconciling with their own history. The UN invested very heavily in accompanying last year's transitional justice planning efforts. Uh, we want to see a proper process put in place. The government uh, body, the technical committee, estimated that it would cost about 12 million US dollars to go through a uh, transitional justice process. But if there is a decision to implement something that falls uh, far short of international standards, I think it's pretty clear that the UN is going to be unlikely to provide uh, the support that will be needed. I've focused on these two fundamental challenges, but uh, I want to say a word about the backdrop. There are huge long-term threats to Burundi. Uh, this is, depending on how you count, it's the world's third poorest or the world's fifth poorest country. Uh, it has a severe overpopulation issue. It has a land shortage. Uh, either way, this is a time bomb. In uh, two provinces, to take one example, Chancuzo and Ruigi, there is 70% uh, 
undernutrition. 70% of children are undernourished, and their developmental indicators are six months behind, meaning those children walk six months late on average. And that, as you can imagine, gets compounded over the, the years that follow. The population is over 90% agriculture develop, uh, dependent. You can imagine the, the risks to that of climate change. This year already, there's been a series of price shocks, which has given an indication of the potential for social instability. Uh, there is acknowledged massive corruption, and although the government has put uh, a number of important measures in place, which has uh, improved Burundi's standing in doing business, for example, uh, some of the attempts to address corruption have run into significant resistance from within uh, the government. So uh, reformers have an uphill task. And this is also an area where the international community's support is needed. Burundi had a remarkably quick integration of the rebel forces into its army. And I feel that this has been insufficiently publicized internationally. It is an extraordinary uh, example. They like to say they had two difficult weeks at the beginning, but then it, uh, it worked out. But some analysts will say that a lot of work still needs to be done to get parties away from the notion that they still need their own army, that no one will really listen to you unless you have uh, arms backing your, your position. Um, I want to end by underlining what was probably evident from Reuters and The Economist, but uh, is also clear if we listen to international experts as a whole on Burundi, and that is that there is not a complete consensus in the international community about the outlook for Burundi. Uh, the glass is half empty or half full. Uh, what is going to be very important is that the international community as a whole encourage Burundi to pursue uh, the reforms, to pursue the reconciliation um, that are vital and not to abandon the country on the basis that it's gotten through its bad times so it no longer needs us as much as it did. That would be the wrong thing to do at this point. Thank you. Hmm. Karen, could I just ask you a couple of questions? Um, that your presentation touched almost all the points that I had made notes, but there were a couple here I wanted to ask you about. One is, um, there is, um, as I understand it, a, a refugee uh, threat, refugees coming back from Tanzania to Burundi. Can you talk about that? Sure. I mean, one reason, one reason we see the importance of Tanzania's role uh, in supporting Burundi is not only that it's a member of the EAC, but if Burundi goes through a severe disruption again, Tanzania is going to uh, be the hardest hit. Uh, Burundi has reabsorbed hundreds of thousands of refugees already, and Tanzania has naturalized, I think it's 170,000 if I'm not mistaken, an extraordinary act of generosity on, on Tanzania's part. Now the last tranche, if we can put it that way, of about 35,000 refugees are to return this year. And of course there's concern with uh, large numbers coming back to a country that is already that already has its own population and space issues. Given that we've seen the others reabsorbed, uh, I am not sure that's where the big risk lies. I think the bigger risk is that this is a politically sensitive group. They are the holdouts, if you like. So there's going to be a lot of interest in seeing how they come back and what they do. And I know that UNHCR is following this process very closely, but it all has to happen in the next six months. I think UNHCR has already uh, announced the cessation clause for this group. So this is, really, this is really the end of the refugee saga for Burundians in Tanzania. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you about was the, was the eight benchmarks in the 2011 resolution. Uh, are, is this still the operating uh, framework? Are they being refined? 
we were asked by the council, the Secretary General was asked by the council to come up with benchmarks for Burundi's transition. And we've had a really good process in Burundi and with the government to say these are the eight issues that link to the mandate and uh, which we can look at to assess how much progress there's, there's been. Now, some of them are on issues that will remain issues long after the political mission has gone. But that's also, I think, a useful thing to continue the monitoring of, of uh, those issues. The reality is that on many of these issues, there aren't even baselines. So uh, what we expect to do is, by the next SG report to the Council, which will be next January, to come back with baselines on some or all of these issues, and then look seriously at what that means for transition. Which of these issues are, say, naturals for passing over to the UN country team? Uh, which, for which issues is it important to have a continued UN political presence, and so on. So that's for early 2013. Excellent. Um, I'd love to take some questions, comments. Just raise your hand. Um, and let me tell you, uh, I'm going to recognize the gentleman in the back, and then this gentleman here will take two at once. Is there a third question? Uh, of course, Jeffrey Laurenti. The third question. We'll take one, two, three. Uh, when the microphone gets to you, please hold it steady, because we are webcasting this, and the only way the sound remains steady is if you do not gesticulate with the hand that's holding the microphone. Uh, hold it steady. Hold it close to your mouth, and please identify yourself. The gentleman in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Sanai Terefe from UNHCR, and I'd uh, like to uh, thank the SRSG for this uh, very detailed uh, presentation. Uh, perhaps just uh, a nuance on the uh, uh, declaration of secession for Burundian refugees. Uh, as of yet, uh, UNHCR has not declared a secession clause for Burundian refugees. However, it is true that uh, a determination process has taken place in uh, Tanzania which is an individual RS, um, review, if you like, of the, uh, of the claims of the individuals that remain. But um, that falls short of a collective declaration of secession, as we have seen, for instance, for Liberian refugees. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the first nuance. Um, the second is a question in relation to Burundi, and, and uh, as the SRSG has pointed out, the land uh, issue, which I think is core to, um, to the peace building process in the country. And the question I would have is in terms of the land laws of Burundi and how close we are to a comprehensive land reform in the country, in particular uh, uh, to do with title and deed uh, appropriation, because I think all uh, observers of the Burundian situation would agree that this is a core uh, uh, protection issue and a core peace building issue. So. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, uh, if I can rest it there. Thank you very much. You know, I was going to let you answer all three at once, but since that was two, answer those first, and then we'll get to the other two. Thanks very much for that important correction on the, on the cessation clause. Uh, on the, uh, I should also add that Burundi still has IDPs. Uh, Burundi has, I think, close to 80,000 people still living in settlements uh, who feel they have not been able to return home. So that's also still to be resolved. The land question is uh, quite volatile. You know, there is a body in place, the CNTB, looking at land claims resulting from returns. And uh, they have handled a large number of cases, but many of their findings have been contested. And we've seen the potential for land issues to flare up. Uh, the new Code Foncière, I think, goes some way to resolving those issues. But there are many other unresolved issues, including inheritance rights. You know, there's been a push to uh, allow uh, women and girls to inherit, which isn't currently the case. And some of the pushback on that is from the perspective that allowing women to inherit as well would just make it completely 
untenable. I think it's probably pretty close to untenable as it is. So uh, all these issues need to be uh, need to be looked at over the next little while. The government has an initiative called Villagisation, which is which also has the intention of grouping uh, people in more urban centers. Burundi currently doesn't really have urban centers to speak of. There's the capital, and then, then there's Gitega at a distant second, and that's about it. But the thinking is, if people could, uh, could move to urban centers where services would be provided and alternative employment would also be available, I mean, to try and wean some of that 90 odd, I think 93 percent, off agriculture as, as their sole uh, subsistence method, then that would decongest the land as well. Thank you. Let's go here. Thank you, Karen. My name is Ella Hotub. I'm the director from the Peace Building Support Office. I want you to develop your thought on an area that you did not uh, go very much in depth with, the economic side. How much of Burundi's inherent fragility is a threat to peace building effort compared to the details that you provided on the political side? And secondly, insofar as the donor support is concerned, how much commitment do you see donors putting forward in terms of supporting the ongoing efforts at peace building? Thank you. Again, since it was two questions, we'll answer that, and then we'll get to Jeffrey Lorenzi. Can I just clarify the second question? It was about donor support. Donor support. How much donor support do you see coming forward, and how much of that lack of, lack of it is linked to progress or none of it? I think at some point, it's a very thin line between the political and the economic development questions. Um, you know, if you if you read that ICG report, which I don't I don't want to sound like I'm endorsing it, that is a perspective that looks at corruption issues, corruption and economic development issues as threats or potential threats to stability. Um, there, there is a line we hear advanced now as well that the past uh, conflict was less about ethnicity and more about power and land. So clearly the land issue is, is central in any reading of, of Burundi's history. Where there's a clear risk is the huge number of young unemployed people. And some of those people are also the former uh, former fighters. You know, like, like many countries in this situation, Burundi also hasn't found a good solution for the reintegration of, uh, of former fighters. There is a government program, but it's, it, as, as PBSO knows, it's been partly funded, but far from fully funded. I asked the second vice president what the solution was to this unemployment crisis, and he said large-scale public works. I think that's right. I think that's right. But I don't see large-scale public works coming from anywhere at this point. And this is where donors uh, come in. Burundi has become a donor orphan. Uh, this year, I'm sorry to say, DFID has pulled out. With DFID has gone Swedish SIDA. And among some of the donors, there is a decision to no longer give support in the form of direct budget support, but to fund uh, programs instead. So one of the shocks I mentioned that the government has been facing this year is shortage of external funding for a budget that is still 50% donor dependent. And when donors looked at the, uh, uh, the new PRSP, which was just adopted in February, they saw that the, uh, the anticipation anticipated donor support in the future, the line went up rather than down. They said, that's not how we see it going. So there's a constant effort to try and invigorate the donor community, but also to give stronger assurances that the money is going to be well spent. I already alluded to the corruption issue, and I think that is uh, clearly a factor in, uh, in making some donors reluctant to invest larger sums in Burundi than they do. Thank you. Jeff? <clears throat> uh, thank you, Warren. Uh, Jeff Laurenti with the Century Foundation. 
Actually, this question comes very nicely on, on the last one. You had begun, uh, uh, Ms. Langren, by talking about there not being very many opportunities to talk about Burundi, outside of Burundi. I mean, it's a classic example of the kind of post-conflict situation about which there's fear of disappearing from the radar screen as soon as the peacekeepers go home, the, uh, the situation that led to the creation seven years ago of the Peace Building Commission, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. New York Peace Building architecture. Uh, and the performance of that architecture is a subject, as you well know, of last Thursday's open debate in the Security Council. So I, I know this is a New york -y kind of question, <laughs> but what's been your experience in the field of the grinding out of this machinery, so-called, in New York that may grind with no, no grain to be milled? <clears throat> um, uh, is it just another layer of New York reporting? Is there actually another advocate that you can turn to? The relations between the configuration com uh, com committee chair and the SRSG uh, would be worth actually, might be interesting to, to hear a bit about. Uh, and has this in any way allowed for a few million more dollars to be pried out of either multilateral, bilateral donors of the Peace Building Fund? What's been the value added, if any, for Burundi of this pioneering effort to create a conscious peace building architecture? Mm -hmm. Shall I take more than one or? <clears throat> Uh, no, no, that's uh, actually, I wanted to ask you about peace building, so I'm glad that Jeff brought it up because I know Burundi is a okay, well, case I of can, that. I can take that immediately then. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we've had very good relations with, with the PBC in Burundi, uh, but Burundi was one of the first two countries to come onto the peace building agenda, as you know. Last year, late last year, Burundi suggested that now was the time to come off and that hasn't happened, and that has, I think, provoked uh, a harder look at what's the value added to a country that has already spent five, six years on. Now, that coincided with the suggestion that Burundi could come off also coincided with the end of PBF funding to Burundi. Burundi had benefited significantly from two tranches of uh, of uh, PBF funding, which, as you know, is triggered automatically when a country comes onto the, onto the PBC agenda. So with that gone, I think there was a bit of sense of, well, what else can the, can the PBC do for us? The government's been very clear about what it expects from the PBC, and that is resource mobilization. And that's also part and parcel of the, of the PBC's terms of reference. So in a sense, this donor, this partner conference that's coming up in uh, October this year is seen by some as a bit of a litmus test. Can the, P the PBC has, uh, and the PBC chair has been unequivocal in saying he's going to be the, uh, the voice for Burundi, Burundi's strongest advocate, a pilgrim uh, in the search for additional funding. We all know why this is a particularly difficult moment to go out searching for new funds and non-traditional donors and so on. I'm sure he'll do the maximum. But this is really the role that, uh, that as I understand it, Burundi would now like to see uh, the PBC continue to play as a donor mobilizer. And that's a challenging role. Uh, the gentleman in the front row here. Um, We'll just take a question one at a time. My name is. Uh, my name is uh, El Meneji Denyonzima. I'm the PR of Burundi to the United Nations. I have got uh, a language barrier as uh, I'm from uh, a French speaking country. But uh, what I want to say here is uh, first to thank you for your presentation. You've uh, recognized the efforts of my government to put uh, Burundi back to the rails of uh, peace and the security for all. Uh, 
but uh, in the same time, uh, I want to say that uh, somewhere there is uh, an exaggeration when you talk about uh, extrajudicial killings. I do recognize that uh, there are some killings in the country, unavoidable, as we are in the situation of uh, post-conflict situation. But uh, saying that uh, you have identified 61 cases of extrajudicial killings, uh, I think that there is uh, some exaggeration because and some misuse of the term of uh, extrajudicial killings. Because even if it's a policeman who kills, it's just a murder. It's not an extrajudicial killing. Because uh, an extrajudicial killing means that the victim was already in detention, in prison. And instead of uh, sending him to justice, he has disappeared, he has been killed. So uh, 61 uh, extrajudicial killings. Uh, we are elected people. We are not a group of criminals. Uh, uh, that's uh, what I wanted to say. I, I think 61 is too much. I'm going to have to ask Thank you to speak much. up. People are having trouble hearing you in the back. Just raise your voice more. I have finished. Okay, I'm, I'm, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry. I just had people in the back who were, who were signaling they weren't hearing you. Well. I just wanted to say that uh, I disagree with the, the information that uh, there have been 61 cases of extrajudicial killings. It, it is too much hmm, for an elected government. Hmm? And I said that maybe it is a misuse of that concept because Extrajudicial killings it has a bit definition, hmm? and uh, th the victim must be in detention already. Hmm? Because even if it is a policeman who kills a citizen, it is a just a murder. It's not an extrajudicial killing. Hmm? So sixty-one cases for we are honourable people. We, we cannot behave like bandits. Uh, it's too much, 61. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Would you like to comment on that? Thanks. I, we're saying the same thing if we're saying that 61 is too many. We completely agree with that. What, what the office has done uh, as an innovation in 2011 uh, in, in Burundi is to actually prepare a, a matrix to show the date, the name, the place, the political affiliation, if known, and what happened, to the best of our knowledge. And then a final column referred to, uh, refers to what action has been taken. And it allows us to track these 61 cases that we've looked into. And that is one of our benchmarks, given the the extent to which impunity is an issue, we want to follow up each of those 61 cases to see what happens. And at this point, six and a half months into the following year, uh, we've seen follow up, I think, in only 10 cases. Uh, 10 cases have come to a conclusion in the courts. Um, we have some reservations about the slowness in, in many cases. But there is a lot to be done uh, in bringing those cases to, uh, to justice, however we label the cases. And this was also the council's concern, that uh, the investigative apparatus is very weak, and ultimately very few cases do come to justice. So this is another area where more work needs to be done, and supported, supported by us as well. A gentleman in the aisle here. Thank you very much. I'm actually curious about two aspects of the situation in Burundi. One hand, the regional dynamics. To what extent do you expect the instability 
in the Congo to adversely impact the security situation in Burundi, or do you think Burundi is pretty much sort of in its own dynamics and not really impacted too much by the current situation in DRC? The second um, part of the situation, second set of dynamics is the change and transition in the UN mission in the country. And there have been some uh, voices of concern expressed uh, about the you know, steady rush to try to quote unquote normalize Burundi and internationalize and to transition quickly into a normal UN presence. To what extent uh, in your time there do you think the pace is as it should be or do you think it should be a bit carefully evaluated to see that normalization does not come too soon? Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, you know, I think the the issue with the DRC most affecting Burundi has not been what we see playing out right now as much as the tendency of some Burundian rebel groups to use the DRC, to use Eastern DRC as a base, uh, as they have also at times reportedly used uh, Tanzania as a base. So I know the government uh, made a number of efforts in 2011 to address those two uh, aspects. But it's a little separate from, uh, apart from the fact that a generally chaotic situation in DRC helps allow that to happen, and that is destabilizing to, uh, to Burundi. Is the timing right? I, I feel that the timing is right. I mean, we're not, uh, I think, the pace at which we are looking at things now, meaning a review in January, February, of where we stand on the baselines, and really the time it's going to take to advance on some of these issues, I see as being a matter initially in the government's uh, court to, to say what they think is a reasonable pace of uh, progression. There are a number of issues in the mandate that are really long-term efforts, strengthening democratic institutions, the judiciary, uh, parliament, these aren't going to be fully strengthened in the space of a year or two. These are long-term uh, matters that need to be embedded in the UN country team after the mission goes. So in that respect, the work for the mission is to make sure that the country team is ready to pick them up and does pick them up. So we have good programs in place that are continued. But I think that given uh, how we now view the risks of return to violent instability, which is relatively low, I think we're on the right track of planning for transition. Oh, good. A woman over here on the, by the wall. I'm Zubaydah Rasul. I wanted to go back to the DRC question for a second because uh, how do you see the two on groups that uh, had separate peace agreements, uh, the 2003 and 2006, uh, meshing in with the uh, new agenda for elections? Uh, we know there have been some reports about the FNL uh, presence in Eastern DRC being strengthened. I'm just asking how is that part of the peace process going? with the other two groups that signed later peace agreements were not part of Arusha, firstly. And secondly, in specific about FNL, because their, their leader or their supposed leader uh, has made a lot of uh, noise over the last year and a half. So I'm just wondering about your reaction to that. What you see is the prospect of them actually having a positive uh, participation in the election process in 2015. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The FNL, led by Agaton Rasa, was the largest opposition party in the elections, came out of the first round with 14% of the vote. So that's quite significant. And I sometimes get the question of what does Agaton Rasa actually represent? And the answer for me is 14%. However, not long after they pulled out and after Wasa himself left the country, there was a change in leadership in the FNL, uh, which he has not accepted, has not recognized. So the current role of the FNL, I think, is a question mark. 
The, I mentioned that a couple of events have taken place this year bringing together the uh, ruling party and the opposition, and the FNL Rwasa has not been present at those events. Uh, we're talking about one round table in the National Assembly, which had the participation of most of the opposition parties, and more recently, a dialogue in Co in Switzerland, uh, which again, I, I think is an excellent initiative. Again, the FNL didn't take part. Um, the FNL and WASA were mentioned in the DRC Group of Experts report quite specifically with detail. And I found it encouraging that WASA almost immediately wrote to me refuting what had been said about him and his party in that report, which I would read at the very least as an intention not to engage in those activities in future, whatever he was doing in the past. Uh, we don't know the extent to which they are still involved in rebellion, and he is extremely uncommunicative. Uh, you know, I've never met him. Uh, people who have talk of a, a rather distant, rather mystic uh, religious figure who communicates through third parties. So honestly, quite hard to know if he would come back and if he would play a role. Uh, I don't know what contact there has been at the level of the government with, uh, with his party, but it would certainly help matters if he were to declare uh, what the intention of FNL Rwasa is for the future. Shirley Chesney, NGO Committee on Disarmament, Peace and Security. I heard you say that it was mostly an agricultural country with land problems over population. How will the people be fed? What developmental plans could you foresee from what mythical donors that would change the economy enough to deal with the situation where there seems to be very little infrastructure or other industry? From where would that come? From outside donors, from corporations, from what? A quick answer to that is that the agriculture as currently practiced in Burundi is not very efficient. And that also has to do with these very small land holdings, which everyone cultivates for self-sufficiency. Uh, now, Burundi's main export is coffee. And both coffee and tea have seen extraordinary variations in price. So it's not a very predictable resource. Uh, there is a lot of hope to expand into increased nickel production and so on, for which lack of power is a, is a factor. So there are a lot of efforts going on right now, from road building to, to rail planning to expansion of power generation. Uh, trying to rationalize the coffee sector and so on, with a view to diversifying, with a view to getting Burundi off this 93% agricultural dependency and into something else. Because if it's just left as it is, there is no good answer to that, to that question. Fortunately, uh, it's really only the northeast of the country that's had severe problems, um, that has had you know, significant food shortages during the time I've been there. And WFP has been able to s step in and support those. But the long-term solution is diversifying away from such huge agricultural dependency. Well, um, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, any more hand? Well, very good, in the third row here. I'm, I'm Luca Nicola from the Swiss Mission. I'm ambassador, the chair of the peace building configuration. Maybe just some uh, remarks regarding actually our engagement uh, in Burundi as, as, uh, as the PBC. Um, I often feel that there is an overemphasis um, on resource mobilization, and our uh, the other aspects of our work are left out, which is we have an important advocacy role to play, and also you know the issue of political accompaniment. So I think to you know define the partners conference as ultimate litmus test for for the role of the PBC in Burundi 
is a bit unfair, I believe. In the end, it's, it is a process or it's a conference driven by the government of Burundi, and we as PBC, you know, we want to make sure that peace building aspects are integrated into it. And maybe to come back to the gentleman's question uh, in the first row, what the added value of the PBC is or can be, I think uh, it's an aspect that is often forgotten is that it is an, a unique intergovernmental body uh, you know, which deals with peace building affairs and so can give uh, you know, countries that are often forgotten like Burundi a voice uh, on a high level like New York in, in, in headquarters and can also play a supportive role for the UN engagement in, uh, in the field. It's just a couple of remarks I wanted to make. Thank you. Do you want to comment? Or? Oh, just to say thank you. Thank you for that. And <laughs> certainly Burundi needs supportive partners. Very good. Well, if I see no more hands, and thanks to that last comment, we got up to date on the PBC. Um, uh, before I thank uh, Karen, there are a couple of extra minutes here, and I just want to extend an invitation to you, and I'll explain. Um, I'm going to ask Beatrice uh, to uh, lift the shades and open the door, um, because on the balcony right now, you have a view of a rather wonderful memorial that is almost completed. Uh, it was, it's called the Four Freedoms Monument. It comes from Franklin Roosevelt's State of the Union message in 1941 when he spoke of the Four Freedoms. Um, it's been in the works for more than 30 years. It is designed by a great American architect named Louis Kahn. It was his last design before he died in 1974. And I, I know some of the people behind it. It's taken 30 years to raise the money to do it, but it now is visible. It's almost completed. It's the very end of Roosevelt Island, and you get a great view of it from our balcony right here. And if you had five minutes, I would recommend on the way out, just step on the balcony and have a look at it. It's a particularly beautiful day today to see it, and I recommend it. Having said that, I want to thank Karen Langren for this um, uh, fulfilling briefing on what's been happening uh, in Burundi, and I certainly want to wish her well uh, as she goes off to Monrovia, and uh, I will publicly say we expect her to keep the promise to come back and tell us about that within the year to come. Thank you. With pleasure.